Okay, so today in Ancient DOS Games, we're covering Dominus, one of the lesser known real-time strategy games out there, and this is actually a surprisingly difficult game to comment on. I think the best word I can use to describe it as succinctly as possible is overcomplicated. This game is absolutely jam-packed with features and content. In fact, the various quantities of all the different things there are in this game was the major selling point on the back of the box. But when it comes down to it, a lot of it really doesn't matter, as you only ever need to use a tiny fraction of what the game presents you with to win. This is actually something a lot of young game designers struggle with in their early days of planning out games, is coming up with all of these different kinds of features to throw in and all kinds of content to go with it. But what ends up happening is that, well, let's say you give the player a hundred different ways to open a box right from the start of the game, and all 100 of those methods are equally viable and have the same odds of success. Well, then the player's not going to care what method they use, they're just going to pick whatever method happens to be the most convenient at the time. And that's what's happening here in Dominus. Despite numerous different traps and monsters and spells, and even an entire interrogation mechanic, really what it comes down to is utilizing just a handful of key spells, using whatever monsters and traps are available, and probably ignoring the interrogation mechanic entirely, because it takes too long and doesn't really help much. That said though, the game is freaking gorgeous. The production values on the artwork are through the roof. Not to mention the music, while nothing special, is also extremely well made. Well, at least as far as the CD audio tracks are concerned. And the gameplay itself does indeed work once you get around some of the clunkiness of the interface. But yeah, it's otherwise just overcomplicated and intimidating when really, at its core, it's actually one of the simpler real-time strategy games out there. Dominus was developed by a company known as Visual Concepts Entertainment, which might not sound very familiar, but they've actually had their hand in quite a lot of well-known titles. Though around the turn of the century, they decided to focus specifically on sports titles, and to this day, well, that's pretty much all they make anymore. It was published by US Gold in 1994, and it's a one-player real-time strategy game. It supports VGA 320x200 256 color graphics, along with a few devices for audio support, but... Well, as far as I can tell, this game doesn't actually have any sound effects. You're selecting a sound device primarily to indicate whether to play back the music or not, which is MIDI based on the floppy disk version, and Redbook CD Audio based on the CD-ROM release, which is the version that I'm playing. Ironically, the CD version does include all of the MIDI music, but I can't find a way to get it to play that music instead since the game won't even run without detecting the presence of the CD, and doesn't have an option to choose the music source. As for its current release date, it's still commercial, and given how incredibly obscure this game is, it's not super easy to find copies of, but all the copies I ran across in my searches were dirt cheap, suggesting that there's virtually no demand for it, with the cheapest loose copy I found for sale online being literally a dollar and a half. That said though, I only ran across one fully boxed copy during my searches, but it too was priced reasonably well at $25, and I couldn't find any copies of the floppy disk release for sale. Though I believe there was also multiple different releases for different European regions, all with slightly different box art and media art, so if you're purchasing this for sake of collecting, you're going to have quite the search on your hands if you're looking for a very specific release, but if all you want to do is have a CD to play it from, then it shouldn't be too hard to get your hands on one. Before you start playing, you have to choose your skill level from the options menu, from one of seven selections. As far as I can tell, this doesn't actually affect the intelligence of the AI at all. Rather, instead, it's determining how much you get in the way of initial resources and monsters, as well as how much health the enemy monsters get, and how fast the AI does everything. So it's just basically altering the balance between you and your opponents. It's also pertinent to note that this setting only affects starting a game. So once you've got a game going or load a saved game, you can't change the skill setting. The gameplay itself is fairly atypical. And basically, by order of an aging king, you are to take dominion of the realm as the outlying clans form an uneasy truce to attempt one final assault to pillage the realm and usurp the throne. Now, despite being an incredibly powerful overlord, you're still just one individual and can only really do one thing at a time. 
So to assist with the war effort, you have four generals, each in command of various legions of monsters. The idea is that as the clans move in on the kingdom, you need to direct your generals to send their monsters into the fray to defend various regions, as well as issue orders for gathering resources, creating traps, setting traps, or performing spy missions. But right off the bat, this whole thing with having four different generals gets very cumbersome very fast, since the kinds of monsters under each general's command does not change. So if you have a general recall monsters from one area, but they're not their monsters and belong to a different general, you have to switch to that general to issue the order to get those monsters back into the fray elsewhere. And there's not really any good feedback to any of this. You can get reports from the generals, which helps a little, but it's not the kind of instant feedback the player really needs to make properly informed decisions. Now, before anyone cries foul, I do want to quickly point out that for many tasks, having the generals boss the monsters around is optional. Basically, there's certain things the generals are good for and certain things they aren't. And moving monsters into battle is, surprisingly, one of the things they're bad at. You typically will be using the generals to place traps, recall monsters, and if you want to get into the espionage aspects of the game, you also need to use the generals to engage in spy missions. But as I already alluded to, the whole thing with spying and interrogations is almost pointless. It's very intricate and can provide you with all kinds of information, including details on how to make spells that you don't get access to right off the bat, but you can totally beat the game without ever delving into the espionage side of things. So the reason the generals end up being optional is because, hey, you're the freaking overlord, you can just do the dirty work yourself, and in more ways than one. When you select a particular area on the kingdom map, you can zoom into it and see what's transpiring. Unfortunately, due to a lack of a mini-map, it can be hard to figure out where the action is when there's only a few enemies present, but these maps are not very big, so it doesn't take long to find the action the hard way. From there, you can insert monsters manually from the entire roster that you have at your disposal, you can place any of the traps you've manufactured, and you can cast spells, arguably the most important reason to ever take direct command of the action, even though you'll probably only ever be using a tiny handful of your spellcasting arsenal. However, if the situation is dire, or you're bored, you have one other option. By summoning your chariot, you can swoop into the battle yourself. You'll get a life bar and can perform melee and fireball attacks, and it's pertinent to note that you are freaking powerful. Both of your attacks can stun lock enemies and are able to hit entire groups at a time when they're bunched together. Now, this doesn't make you invulnerable, but it's definitely a viable strategy to take out an entire regiment all on your own. Your health also slowly regenerates while outside of combat. Well, the controls are a bit weird though. Well, the mouse buttons are used to perform your two attacks, so to move, you have to hold the shift key down. Otherwise, you just stand still. Yeah, it's weird, but at least it works. Other things you can do while not focused on the ensuing battles is interrogate any prisoners you've captured, do some spell crafting, create traps on your own accord without relying on your minions to do it, or visit the dungeons to pick out some monsters to merge together to form brand new mutant monsters. Now, this monster merging mechanic is actually really interesting, though as with most things in the game, even though you have a lot of control over how this turns out, there's almost never a reason to really pay attention. Just pick some monsters which are convenient, merge them together Together and bam, new mutant to unleash upon your adversaries. It's important to note though that mutants cannot be commanded to attack by the generals, so if you want to use mutants in combat you have to insert them into the fray on your own accord. Now, you can even merge new monsters together out of the prisoners that you've taken, but that just begs the question, how do you even get prisoners? Well, that's where the traps come into play. Each trap is basically a combination of a trigger mechanism and a hazard to inflict. Now, certain triggers and hazards work better against certain kinds of enemies or worse against others, and also determines if the trap will be a capture trap or a lethal trap. Now, there's not really a good way to determine if your traps are lethal or not if you create them yourself, but monsters make traps extremely slowly, so it's better to just do it yourself. You can also place traps individually, but in this case, it's better to just have your generals do it since they can do it way faster. 
And once you have some prisoners, you can interrogate them. Now, this process is slow and doesn't really help much, especially considering that time doesn't stop for this. But if it wasn't already obvious, let me point out that everything is going on in real time in this game. No matter what you're doing, time is passing and things are happening. So because of how long interrogations take for how little they provide in terms of practical results, and it's generally better to just immediately send your prisoners to the kennels to be used for crafting mutants. But even this takes time, since you have to send each prisoner one by one, wading through animations for each. It'd be nice if there was just a send all to kennels button. However, one simple fact is ultimately going to dawn on you, and might have already. How do you quote build new units. Now, mutating monsters is a net loss of 5 every time you do it, and taking captives is a very slow process, so where does that leave you? Well, magic. The spellcrafting aspect of the game is pretty straightforward. You have a spell book with a massive number of spells to choose from, with each spell requiring particular components depending on its effect. You then craft charges of the spells you want to use in battle out of those components. And despite the overabundance of different spells, many of which you're never going to use, you're going to notice some of these spells are actually extraordinarily powerful for how little they cost to implement, with one such spell being the clone spell. Any monsters you clone are cloned permanently, meaning they're added to your armies. There's other powerful effects too, such as being able to cause deadly explosions, charming enemies into attacking their allies. Heck, there's even a spell which just flat out lets you erase individual enemies from existence. Eventually, with some effort, you'll eradicate all eight clans vying to remove you from power and you'll win the game, with the ending you get altered slightly depending on your skill selection and which clan you eradicated last. Now just remember to keep your spell ingredients well stocked, lay tons of traps, and never be afraid to get your hands dirty by fighting your own battles, and you're pretty much set. Overall, Dominus isn't a bad game, but again, it's overcomplicated. It has tons and tons and tons of features you really don't ever need to touch to win, especially once you realize which specific features you have are the ones which are going to guide you to victory. Now, I gave the game two runs on the lowest and second lowest skill settings, and despite how bad I am at strategy games, I won both times despite not having the level of control or information that I would have preferred. Unfortunately though, there's not much variety to the gameplay following. Now, every run of the game goes the exact same, with the same kingdom, the same areas to defend, the same clans trying to oust you, it gets repetitive fast. So determining if you'd enjoy the game or not really comes down to what it is you want out of an RTS game. Now, this game's kind of like a halfway point between Populous and Warcraft in terms of how it plays and what you can do, but with only a single map to play instead of dozens or hundreds. Now, if you're okay with that, then the game's definitely worth trying out, but for most players and RTS fans, while well, you might still enjoy this game for a little, you won't be sticking with it for very long as the repetition sets in. So I ran into a lot of troubles trying to get this game working, none of which had to do with DOSBox's configuration settings. So generally speaking, all you have to do is set DOSBox to an average fixed cycles count, something like 8,000 or 10,000, you should be good to go. Plus, if you're running the floppy disk version, you shouldn't have any trouble there either. However, this is one of the few instances I've run into of a copy-protected CD in terms of DOS gaming. Well, I tried using two different programs to rip a CD image file for image mounting in DOSBox, and neither worked. Both ended up in an endless buffering loop, one of which I could stop, the other refused all efforts to stop. In fact, even Windows 10 was unable to kill the process in any way, forcing me to restart my computer using my physical reset button. Which yes, my Windows 10 PC has a reset button. I intentionally bought a modern case which had one because of how much I don't trust technology. So my only option was to mount the actual CD with the hyphen IO control command line parameter, which sort of worked, but vanilla copies of DOSBox don't buffer CD audio very well from real CDs. And in fact, neither does DOSBox ECE, resulting in occasional stalling and stuttering as more audio is buffered from the real CD. The DOSBox X, on the other hand, has a different means of buffering real CD audio, which doesn't result in stutters but does result in the audio having a delayed start from the points that it should be playing from. So given those choices, I went with DOSBox X. If rendering real CD audio wasn't an issue, then all variants of DOSBox would be just fine to use. 
Anywho, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Next Saturday for ADG Pro, we're going to be taking a look back at one of my favorite DOS games to give the weapons a once-over, because I'm pretty sure the stat numbers they're reporting are a lie. So make sure to stay tuned to see the investigation unfold, and to confirm whether I'm just going crazy or if the game in question is indeed subjecting everyone to some falsehoods. Thanks for watching, everyone, and extra special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small set of you guys.